Mediation Pitfalls and a Four-Letter Word featuring Darcy Thompson, Mediator. Part of the series, Mediation Tips by Fran. Welcome to the Lawyers and Mediators International Show and Podcast by InstantMediations.com, where we discuss law and conflict resolution topics to educate both professionals and everyday people. Catch regular episodes on YouTube, the Instant Mediations app, and anywhere you get your podcasts. Just remember, nothing in these episodes constitutes legal advice, so be sure to talk to a lawyer as cases are fact-dependent. Hey everyone, this is Mac Pierre-Louis, attorney, mediator, and arbitrator working throughout Florida and Texas. And Natalia Ołowska-Czajka, advocat, mediator, and arbitrator from Warsaw, Poland. And I'm Fran Brockstein, an attorney and mediator in Texas, and it is my extreme pleasure to introduce my dear friend Darcy Thompson today, who I invited to come speak. We've met when we were both on the board of ACRH Houston, and we both now serve on the board of the Texas Association of Mediators. Darcy, would you introduce yourself briefly for us? So thank you, Fran, Mac, and Natalia. My name is Darcy Thompson. I'm a retired educator and a professional mediator. Um, I mediate both um, for private clients and I do a lot of volunteering as well. So I'm very glad to be here today. You can find me on LinkedIn or on Twitter. And my Twitter um, handle is at Peace Mediations. Well, many years ago, Darcy, a judge said to me that even the thinnest pancake has two sides. So she always liked to hear both sides of a story. So that's a lot of what we're going to discuss today. So could you share a few of your thoughts regarding uh, mediation pitfalls? So thank you. Yes. So I've mediated hundreds of cases. And one of the um, pitfalls, potential pitfalls that I've noticed is when someone claims the other side is not being truthful. So based on my experience with the uh, reaction that that's likely to bring, I've kind of developed a roadmap or a way that I typically respond when there is a um, claim of that's not true. And um, I'd like to add quickly for anybody who's listening to this on the podcast, uh, be sure to check out the YouTube video because there is a PowerPoint presentation that Darcy's put together that is showing on our screen right now. And so that's just for folks who might be listening. And at this point in time, I will start the presentation and give Darcy the floor. Thanks, Mac. So one of the things that I would say, and we'll leave it there for just a second. Um, one of the things I'll say is a major pitfall or potential pitfall is when people in a mediation claim that the other side is not being truthful. There are lots of reasons or possible reasons for um, the disputed facts and they come in, you know, all sorts of reasons. So sometimes, you know, some one side or the other has limited facts, their memory lapses, um, different perception of the facts, and um, one of the ones that are, it's real common is, you know, it was a gift. No, it was a loan. And you get that a lot, especially with people, or I found it with people who were in a relationship, who are no longer in a relationship, and now we're in mediation trying to get some of that stuff resolved. I wonder, there are some other things that um, I have experienced. I want to ask Fran and Mac and Natalia to weigh in and talk about other times that you heard it, and then maybe we'll uh, share some more. Yeah, well, definitely. And uh, we're all go around and kind of share our experiences. But when I was previewing your PowerPoint presentation, um, I did wonder back to the mediations I've done where one party was basically accusing the other side of lying. And I guess if I had a dollar for every time a party accused the other side of lying, whether it's in a mediation or in court, right? Hey, can they just say that? They were lying. Um, I'd be a millionaire because this is just what happens 
even though people sometimes have a different version of the truth, right? Or they're just lying. But uh, this is kind of why we're having this, this discussion because um, it, it's something that happens all the time. Um, ladies, is would you concur with this? Absolutely. And um, the issue is that once this very word that is today hidden in our title under the um, full letter word, which is the word liar, and when this word is being said, it really uh, spoils the atmosphere so much. It's so hurtful. So it's like even if by this moment in mediation you build some trust, it suddenly all goes in ruin. It's like no words that will be said afterwards will be heard and understood. It's like getting to point zero again and needing to make all the effort again to start building the trust, to start empowering the communication between the parties in mediation. This is why it is it's like actually throwing a bomb into um, the mediation room, even if it's a virtual room. Absolutely. And so, uh, uh, of course, everyone that comes to mediation is in conflict and generally they don't trust each other. So as a trained neutral facilitator, it is the role of the mediator to diffuse the situation. And sometimes I've just told people, just let's sit back and take a deep breath. You both have a, are looking at the same problem from different angles. A lot like uh, there's this old saying about the elephant where the blind men were describing the elephant and all of them told the truth. It was just their perception of the part of the elephant that they were touching. So Darcy, what do you do to try to diffuse a hostile situation? So one of the things that um, as a mediator, we don't know if they're lying or not usually. Now, sometimes it becomes apparent later if they've made several conflicting um, statements to us, but usually we don't know. And so um, if it really is a concern, sometimes you'll find out or sometimes I've seen it where somebody says he's lying or she's liar, then that's all they need to get it off their chest that somebody has heard them, that the other person is not being truthful. Sometimes the other side is just like, I've heard it before, let's just move on. I just wanna get through with this. If that's the case, then I try to, I try to, um, honor that self-determination that that's not an issue they really want to address at that time and move on. However, usually that's not the case. Usually it's a big issue. Like you said, Fran, we have to diffuse it. And if you'll go on, go on to the next slide for me, Mac, mm -hmm. then in trying to diffuse it, sometimes I find it's helpful to get some clarification for the parties because maybe one side doesn't believe the other side because they don't have all the information. So I will assist as the mediator in trying to maybe clarify the specific details. You know, these are points that they both agree on. And here are some other areas that maybe the other side was not aware of. I also try to get them to move forward and I'm constantly trying to um, diffuse and get them on track so that in the limited time that we have in a mediation, they don't spend all their time on he said, she said, mm -hmm. and get bogged down just in that because you may never convince the other side, right? So let me ask you, Darcy, do you typically find yourself, uh, well, say it a different way, is it a big deal when parties don't get to the quote unquote truth or is sometimes just getting folks to the point where they just hold their nose and reach an agreement enough. So I find that there are some people who can't move on. And usually when that happens, um, I break it into caucus. I try to remind them of what they uh, claim what they've stated is their uh, interests, what they're trying to get resolved and try to focus them on that. But there are other people who just hold their nails and go on and 
I'm going to let them do that. I believe that, you know, that's part of that self-determination piece of, you know what? I heard it. She said it. I'm going to, I'm going to get it over because it's been interrupted. Cause I'm always going to, I'm going to interrupt that. He's a liar. She's lying. I'm going to interrupt that, but not bogged down. So I think both of those can be true based on the individuals. Okay. Do you want me to go to the next slide? I do. So another thing, if, and getting a little bit more clarification, we find out that the, um, Disputed fact is based on inaccurate information or limited information or restricted information. I try to get them to bring out those points so that someone knows that I was in a mediation and one side was, uh, it was actually a, a church mediation and one side felt like the other, they were both ministers, but one side felt like the other side really was not being, um, fully engaged and the basis for how they were making those decisions were inappropriate. And once they started talking and found out that they had similar basis, a similar basis, but were just making different decisions, they really were able to get their situation resolved. And this was a situation that had been going on for decades. Decades. Can I, can I ask an example. Um, let's say, you know, I do a lot of family law mediations and let's say you have a typical child support, you know, dispute between a mom and a dad and the they used to be living together. So therefore she knows about his income. Right. Let's say they used to file taxes together. So she's aware of what he typically brings, what he typically makes. However, they're at mediation now and they're having a fight or dispute over child support. The mediator is trying to get them to reach an agreement and uh, make peace. But he has his number that he thinks is fair and is based on the law. And she disputes it and calls him a liar, accuses him of basically lying about his income on which the child support calculation is based. So where do you go from there? Is that what you're referring to when you say that you want the folks to try to um, get to the get each other to understand the other's basis? Is that an example of it? Or how would you help her and him reframe their understandings so they can maybe move on past this alleged lie in that example? So. I don't do a lot of family mediation. I have that training, but I don't do a lot of family mediations, but I have done a lot of post-divorce mediations where they have been couples and they are um, fighting over um, assets, medical bills for kids, other types of things. And so my focus with them then is, but what is most important to you? You think he's lying and do you, you can spend all your time talking just about that, or you can see what is it that you need from him? And can you get that? You might not ever convince him to admit that he's not being truthful if that's what you believe, but you might still have an opportunity to get what you need to get out of this and move on. So I'm always trying to get them to look forward and not pass because Sometimes they really are telling the truth, you know, and both sides may know it. The And the other side knows that, you know, she knows that I'm not telling the truth about what I have, you know, as assets. So that's what I do. And I know, Fran, you do a, a lot. And Natalia, maybe you as well. Do you do something similar? It's, it's, I am, not, I tell people at the very beginning that I don't have a horse in this race. I don't have a dog in this hunt that I am not here to be the tr deciding who's telling the truth. The judge can do that in a courtroom. What I encourage people to do is to empower themselves to make decisions, decide what's relevant to them. Cause I never know what's important to them. And then see if we can figure out a way creatively to have both people become winners. So cases settle usually, I, 
I always tell people I, I laugh when I, I settled a case yesterday and how we settled it was nothing I would have ever anticipated. But the parties negotiated, they fought and they, they weren't, I put them in separate rooms because it was too hostile. And then we finally chiseled away at it. And at the end of the day, they both felt that they came out ahead. And then wearing both hats, so being the mediator and being the attorney who participates in mediation, I can see sometimes how uh, important it is for um, the clients to find some sort of support in the mediator that they're looking for. This is why they're using all those words to gather the interest on them, so to, to also bring some sort of uh, personal emotions into them, like... Oh, I am the one who suffered because this four-letter word, liar, uh, again, is hurting me. And uh, um, sometimes when I listen to people who come back from mediations, they are empowered also by feeling that the mediator was, as they used to call it, was on their side. Whereas it wasn't on their side. It was actually uh, ex allowing them to express themselves finally um, in the relationships when they were um, closed, when they were um, feeling intimidated. And then mediation suddenly releases all those barriers and uh, you can look at the situation anew with a skilled mediator. Having said that and having um, those fantastic mediators with me, I would want to move on to the response to this liar word. And Darcy, a part of your presentation shows that you have four points response to that, to that four letter word. Could you be more specific on what this response would, um, would embrace? Okay, so I have really spent um, a lot of time just kind of narrowing because I feel as the mediator, I try to do most of the stuff that I have to speak about at the beginning in my introduction. And so for the rest of the process, I'm guiding the process, I'm fostering the process, but I don't like to interrupt them if they're making progress, if they're talking, or if I'm in caucus, then I'm going back and forth. If I hear the word liar, the four letter word, the offensive word, the word that you know is likely gonna um, invoke a huge outburst on the other side, I start with interrupting. Even if it's doing initial statements, which I almost never interrupt them doing initial statements, I interrupt them. I um, tell them that that's not a word. I try not to repeat the word if I can avoid it. That's not a word that's going to facilitate a conversation. And that's the purpose of the mediation. You're here. I'm here to help facilitate that conversation between the two of you so that you can reach, hopefully, an agreement to get this matter, this dispute settled. So I interrupt. And then... I also rephrase for them. So I give them some examples of other words to say. I'm not saying you cannot express that you don't believe what he's saying, but you might want to say, she's not telling the truth. That's not how I remember it. Um, I don't recall you ever doing that, or um, I have a different uh, memory of it. Then I try to redirect them back to what it is that they are trying to um, get resolved in mediation. While I'm doing steps one, two, and three, interrupt, rephrase, and redirect, in the back of my mind, I'm always doing a little ethics check. So um, I am committed to the model standards for mediation that were um, outlined by the American Bar Association, the American Arbitration Association, and um, the Association for Conflict Resolution. And then in Texas, uh, the organization that I belong to is uh, Texas Mediator Credentialing Association that also echoes the um, standards and ethics uh, practices that um, I've committed to. And so in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, as a mediator, I don't want to be involved in misrepresenting any information. I don't wanna be involved in 
forward, uh, forwarding or promoting inaccurate information that is deliberately being stated. And so I find it's very important to make sure that when I make a comment that I attribute it to the source. So Jerry said this, Monica said that, Terrell wanted me to share with you this. And so I'm very careful in um, trying to do that. Um, and I know that different places have different standards, different states have different um, kinds of information that they require for their ethics, but all of those things. So that's my four point response. Interrupt, rephrase, redirect, and do an ethics check. And I okay. welcome your response. Thank you. Could we go through each one? So for the interrupt, how do you make sure that the person doesn't take offense? So um, I do, I'm a handsy kind of person. So I actually will usually just do something with my hands that just kind of gives them a visual. And then I will actually just interrupt them. I have been told by a number of people, even in education, that I have a very calming manner and um, actually have heard um, a judge ask, ask for a patient mediation. I thought, oh, I heard my middle name and I stood <laughs> right up and went on in. And it was one of those mediations that she actually did want me to uh, handle it was a volunteer mediation I was doing at the court. And so, um, it's been well received. I haven't had any pushback from interrupting and I just make the comment, that's not a word that is going to be helpful in facilitating the uh, mediation and the conversation. I try to keep it brief because I want them to go on with the mediation, but the second time it happens, I usually break into caucus because usually that means the other person may be can't help from saying that. And what I'm looking at on the other side is if somebody is turning red. I had somebody turn red. I could see, I could almost see the steam rising from one side when the other side was making their initial statement. And I thought, okay, are they? So I was trying to keep a sensor on the um, defendant while the plaintiff was going over their initial statement. And did I need to separate them early on or if this person was going to be able to tolerate being able to hear what the other side was saying. Yeah, um, real quick, um, Darcy, how much is this connected to uh, what we call positional bargaining, you know, versus, you know, principal negotiation where you're trying to, what well, well, this is the book getting to yes, right? Where you're trying to take the parties away from uh, arguing about the problem and seeing the other person as the enemy and seeing that, that trying to avoid that issue where they're hardened in their own positions, how much is this, what you're trying to do now related to that? So quite a bit, because I really um, emphasize mediation is not a place where you can punish the other side. That's not what it's about. It's about trying to get a win-win, getting something that you're still in charge of, you're not putting a third party in charge of your life and your outcomes, and they may not know what is important to you. Like you said earlier, what is really, one of you said that, what is really important to you? So I may have a different um, priority on getting an apology versus the money. And somebody else may really need that money. So what is important to you may not be the same as what the jury or the judge finds. So I really do feel like that is a big part of it. Um, I wanted to hear from some other people what their thoughts are on that. Well, that's why I mediate because I think it's fun. I never know what will settle a case. I could make predictions, but over and over all these years, I have learned to ask lots of questions and lots of follow-up questions. I always like to start at a mediation as I have no magic fairy dust. I don't perform miracles. But if I could do all of that, give me the top five or six things that you need today. 
And many times that's the first time that person's been asked that question. And it really helps them focus and it helps me focus on where we're going that day. But a lot of times at the end of the day, where we started and where we end up is completely different. So that's why I love mediation. There isn't anywhere else there you can get this uh, sort of flexibility. No court of dispute can give you that. No, um, no other um, place where um, under the warranties and all the um, guarantee of confidentiality, the party can really not only solve their problem, but also improve the, their communication. However, the role of the mediator will be to have sometimes... Um, I wouldn't say a leading role, but um, the um, being the moderator of this conversation might require interrupting, might require ordering people to go to those uh, caucus rooms when they can rethink what they just um, thought. Which brings us to um, the other um, element of your strategy, uh, Darcy, to fight with this, which is rephrase. And we... As mediators, we all know that it is the technique that is most commonly advised to mediators, uh, so most commonly um, taught so that everybody can um, just make sure that what they heard is being understood. But in here, it has a totally different role because you are, you, you are hearing a word that you don't want to be repeated, however you are to rephrase it. And... Uh, I can see on the screen on the presentation some of your suggestions, but if uh, we as mediators can bring up some um, interesting um, phraseology to that, that will be actually quite helpful how we can rephrase this unwanted for letter word. And liar is such a offensive word to most people that most people will follow that lead if you give them the um, words to rephrase it, in my experience. And what they want to make sure is, is that you understood them. So as a mediator, one of the things that I tell them sometimes, especially in negotiations and if I'm in caucus, I, I uh, share that as a mediator, what I can do is I can deliver the message, I can deliver the offer without the sting, without the little barb at the end that sometimes comes up when they are talking to one another and they haven't been able to move forward. In rephrasing that four letter word, liar, I'm teaching them a technique of delivering that same message without the sting. And I feel like that's important. Would you like me to move on to the next? Please. Okay. So in redirecting the, I believe that it's not necessarily productive to just go round and round and round with the he said, she said, especially if the other party is sticking to their guns and saying, you know what? I said it, it's out there. Sometimes the reason they're not going to say anything other because the fact, the truth may be even harsher than the comment they made. So they might have said something and the other party may not be aware of. If I actually told you the truth, you'd really be upset. So I've chosen to use this and you know it's not true. I know it's not true, but I'm going to just stick with that. So I'm trying to get them to refocus on getting back on track with trying to figure out how they can resolve the matter in a win-win situation. If they get really mired down and the other side is being dishonest, I do go over um, the best and worst alternatives to a negotiated situation, including if you're this angry with this person, don't you want to get this resolved today so that you don't have to talk to them again? Don't you want to move forward without this aggravation in your life? 
without having to spend more time thinking about, okay, now we've got to go before a judge. We've got to go to court. We've got to do trial. We've got to take off from work. You could maybe get this finished. So maybe they're not going to um, settle on a shared set of facts about that disputed um, statement, but you can still move forward and get through with this and have a good outcome. I always laugh when people come to me and they say, I need closure. Well, as I've gotten older, I learned one thing. Most things in life, you don't get closure. So what I will tell people is if he is a liar, for example, he's never going to admit it. So do you want to just dwell on that today or do we want to move forward? Because a lot of times, um, especially in family mediation, the emotional toll on the parties is unbelievable. I have people that their blood pressure is through the roof. They're having heart palpitations. And I'm like, do you want to keep doing this for another year before you go to trial? Or do we want to end this? And you can take control of your life and go on. And um, it's been really interesting. Some people just want to fight. Other people realize that they can take their power back by resolving this dispute, ending it, and going on with their life. It's so important that people feel that they're in control. And that's why mediation is such a great tool. We've used the term caucus today. And just to clarify, caucus means... We put the people in two different rooms. A lot of people may not know what that term is. We use the term because we hear it all the time. But caucus is when you split the people up. And many times that minimizes um, the hostility. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next slide. Okay, so when I talked about ethics checks, I said in the background, when I'm doing my interruption my rephrasing and my redirecting. In the back of my mind, I'm still always thinking about ethics. I'm thinking about making sure that I am in compliance with the ethics from the model standards and my local um, Texas uh, Credentialing Association. And so it's important that uh, we're promoting honesty and candor and more important, for me, that I am not knowingly misrepresenting any material fact. And I, I want to also say I'm a non-attorney mediator. However, I know that um, attorneys have an additional set of regulations regarding honesty. And I guess I would let uh, Fran, Mac, Natalia speak to that part of it. But I'm always making sure that although I don't know if the statement is true or false, that if I make a statement in a mediation, I'm saying, Kyle asked me to tell you this, or Sarah said, even if I'm just rephrasing in a joint session, I'm attributing that information to the source. And Mac, I see that you were nodding. Yeah, no, I was agreeing. Um, I was just imagining that scenario where you are in caucus, you hear one thing from one side, you go into the other side and you want to be careful not to be seen as the source of inaccurate information. So this is why you would then give this example. Well, John Doe in the other room told me to tell you, right? Because the thing that we all forget sometimes, guys, is that later after this mediation, these two parties may talk, right? And sometimes they get to the bottom of whether or not the mediator was quote unquote lying. I've heard that before. You know, I actually saw a mediator's negative review once where a party went to town on the mediator, you know, by describing the mediator as dishonest because they spoke after the mediation and they concluded, doesn't mean it's true, but they concluded that the mediator was quote unquote lying to the both of them in order to try to get them to to play off the other, all right? So you gotta be very careful with that. And like you said, as far as attorneys, we have to be extra careful um, just because you know, a mediator is a facilitator, right? They were a conduit to try to get 
each party to communicate with, to communicate with the other you know side their opponent in a way that's going to produce an agreement and if it can't happen it's not our job to force it to happen or to trick the parties into a settlement agreement it's our job to try to get them to see eye to eye in a way that's you know that's the ethical and if unless anybody has any other thoughts about the ethics of this i can move on to the next slide so i always try to keep some things in mind when i am dealing with that four letter word that has jumped out into the mediation and interrupted the um process but needs to be um addressed somehow is sometimes both sides of the situation can be true. Both people can be honest and it's perceived by the other side as being um, untrue, but both sides can be true. And excuse me, <clears throat> emotions have a great impact. Sometimes they impact the actual situation when it was in real time and sometimes it impacts the memory of a of the facts and conflict and so people can be very committed to know this is the truth but it's based on the emotional influence around that situation when it occurred and what's happening and sometimes they both know that somebody's not really being honest. And like I said, it can be for different situations. It can be that they are actually trying to be um, a little gentler with the person. They might actually feel like the actual truth would be a lot more painful. It could be that just they just decided that they weren't going to be truthful about it. Okay, but a lot of times both sides know what happened because they were both there in real time. And then if one side makes an apology, it can really make a huge difference. And I've seen that happen, um, you know, just from a reaction that the other side apologizes on their own. I've also seen it when the other side has asked for an apology and it's gotten it. I've seen it when a person has asked for an apology. It hasn't gotten it either. So, it depends. If I'm in caucus with one side or the other, if an apology has been broached, if that subject has been broached, I'll ask about it in um, caucus. If it's something that one side says they want, I'll ask them if they want me to ask the other side. So I do see that that can be a very, very helpful um, strategy is to have an apology. Absolutely. This a couple, of, a couple of times what I've done is when the person doesn't feel that they really owe an apology, I'll say, well, why don't we try this? Say, if I did hurt you, I didn't mean to do it, and I do apologize. And I cannot tell you how powerful that has been to resolve uh, mediations and when I practice law as an attorney. Uh, one case, I had my, I had a giant military guy, looked like a refrigerator, and his girlfriend, they had a baby together, was this teeny tiny little thing. And I said, just a second, you'll fight for the military, but she terrifies you? He said, yes, ma'am. And I said, just go to her and say, if I ever hurt you, I'm sorry, you're a wonderful mother for our child. And he looked at me and I said, just trust me, do it. And he did it. We settled everything in five minutes. So sometimes even an apology that includes the word, if I hurt you, I'm sorry, can just go a long, long way. And when you mention I'm um, apology, uh, when we are speaking about the four letter word, do you mean apology for using this word? Or do, or do you mean the apology in its broader meaning being the apology for a particular act or, or things that happened in the past and you can see during the mediation that are still hurtful to the participants? I, what do you mean? So I'm glad you brought that up, Natalia. So two things. 
occasionally, if somebody has used that four letter word, liar, if they use it again, they'll say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then they'll use one of the alternate phrases. But I don't hear that as much when they've moved on. If it's been interrupted and they moved on, I don't hear the apology um, as much. What I do hear an apology from is usually from the other person who has been accused of being dishonest. And I wanted to echo uh, what Fran said. I think if I'm in caucus, I try to make sure I do what you do, and that is rehearse what an apology might sound like, because some apologies are not helpful. Some apologies are going to create more of a, a disruption to the process. So yes, what would you say? And how do you think that that will sound to the other person? I think that's real important, Fran. I think that is because sometimes the sting of the apology is rough. So in caucus, if they're in caucus and there's going to be an apology, I do try to do that rehearsal. Okay, we'll move on to the next slide. So another thing that um, I believe I try to keep in mind is that sometimes you're never going to get to the same set of facts, but you can still get to an agreement. So I've had people, you know, say, they didn't do this. They said they did this. They never did this. They're not telling the truth. They're lying, all of that. But when they are able to come up with some common agreements, those agreements don't have to be based on the same determination. For instance, maybe they're saying, okay, it's going to be $12,455. And one side says 20% of that is based on kind of like a penalty because you were late in this and you didn't do what you said. And so that's the case. And the other side is saying, you know, that's just the worth of it. And so the fact that they have a common amount, even if they don't agree on the underlying factors of what it represents, they can come up with an agreement. And I um, encourage them to go ahead and move forward. I don't know if y'all have seen that. Have you had that situation happen? I've had that happen a few times. Ladies? I've had it happen that, it, you know, sometimes it's irrelevant. Let's just pick a number and go forward. Um, again, Darcy, you know, I've learned a lot from you and asking questions and getting the people to think outside the box is so important. Sometimes to diffuse a situation, I will say, let me just throw something out and you're free to ignore it. And I just start throwing out crazy suggestions. And then all of a sudden, the person starts throwing out other suggestions that I would have never considered. And somehow we get to resolution. So a lot that I consider my job being is when we're stuck, I start trying to think of unusual ways to get people to move. Good, Natalia, we're gonna add something before I move on. I think that sometimes, um, for example, when I deal with cases where there is a figure involved, I ask I ask in advance for people to prepare the justification of this figure. And sometimes, as you can imagine, those figures are absolutely out of the blue, right? So those justifications for those figures um, might be really um, fantastic to a degree. But if other, we, we don't know what really sometimes makes people being um, committed to certain things. So sometimes hearing the story behind the figure may, might be uh, a way for the other party to understand why this figure needs to be such or why how it was calculated it's it's probably uh, something about triggering our brains that there is reasoning behind it so it's not a figure that just fell off the sky and is there on the table someone's saying no you mean you yeah, know this is this amount of work for uh, um, 
this many days uh, that I worked on that or uh, things that are other things that are connected. This is also repaying me for some other effort I needed to make and another cost that I am encumbered in connection with the pro providing these goods. So um, that might also be a very important. And it's not about lying. It's about being creative in finding ways to justify your demands. And um, anything that brings party parties closer to the agreement is always welcome in mediation, as I say it. Yeah. I, have, I, have, I have a quick comment before you move on, but go ahead, Mac. No, I was just going to add to what Natalia said about, um, you know, she used the word justification and I use the word rationale. Sometimes I've, I'll ask a party before I go to the other side. Hey, before I say this, can you give me a rationale as to why you have this position so that it will tend to clear away any potential misunderstanding so when i go to the other side and i explain here's the position and here's why that rationale sometimes cuts right through it so that people understand well most folks might lie about something but it's really hard to lie about a rationale okay so sometimes that works and it's just a way of building bridges and building understanding so people can see that okay i'm not being cheated here there's a reasoning as to why um, the person has a position. So, and a quick comment from me is, I agree wholeheartedly with what the three of you have said in that rationale, especially if the offer that they're making is uh, difficult because I'm telling them that for both sides, I'm trying to present your offer in the best possible light. So help me understand this so I can explain that to the other side. And um, also, I think it's important to really focus on what it is they say they want. I had a um, client who said it wasn't about the money. It wasn't about the money. And the other side, uh, the manager was there, but the owner was not there. So uh, in caucus, the um, manager called the owner and put him on speakerphone so we could hear all of it, which I wouldn't have done, but you know, we just be quiet and listen to what happened. And so the manager was trying to convince the owner that yes, indeed, they had violated the law. They really were um, going to be on the hook for this and this and this and that amount. And the owner was absolutely uh, firm in that he was not going to um, pay out any money. So when the um, plaintiff came back in and I was talking to the plaintiff, I said, good news. You said it wasn't about the money. Well, he's not offering any money. <laughs> and well, actually the guy offered like under $20 for several thousand dollars, I think, but he offered $20. So I said, well, it's not really, he said, and it settled. What he got was an apology and a quote unquote commitment from the company that they were not going to uh, continue with this practice in the future. But hmm. really focusing in on what they say they want. And the guy said, it's not about the money. So yeah. my presentation is good news. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> remind, them, <laughs> remind them of what they wanted. Exactly. Yes. Okay. I'm moving on to the next slide. And so uh, finally, uh, what I say about keeping in mind is that it can be very unpredicted, unproductive to just spend a tremendous amount of time on he said, she said, you really want, I try to make them look forward, try to get a resolution and get their needs met. Don't worry so much about punishing the other side. Don't worry about everybody else in the world. You think they might do this. You can only try this one case and you're only mediating one case. Okay. And Darcy, I do that a lot. I'm like, I can't fix the past, but we can change the future. Let's look towards the future. What are your goals for when you leave today to go on with your life? And I find that to be very empowering for the participants because the past is the past. 
Mediation is a really powerful and effective process. There have been some times when I've been doubtful and have been very shocked to see something get resolved. I've seen people who there was a um, a gentleman and a woman who were involved in a um, dispute. She was angry that he held the door for her to walk through. I thought, okay, this is not going to get settled. Not only did it get settled, but she allowed, it was a contractor, she allowed the contractor to come back and fix his work instead of just asking for money. So it's powerful. So I always say, trust the process and keep building your skills. Amen. And finally, so uh, we're wrapping this up now. Darcy Thompson, thank you so much for the chat today about uh, this four letter word and this problem of this accusation and how it can break apart a mediation unless you have a good mediator who can find you know ways tricks of the trade to help parties who are at each other's throats find peace and reconciliation anyway it's completely possible um let me stop my screen share you know we've all had um, mediations over the years that we thought weren't ever going to sell, right? I've had that. Um, I've sometimes been the attorney on a case where I finished the mediation, it settled, and I was just singing that mediator's praises for a week. I'm like, you won't believe it, but this mediator got those two to agree, you know, to patch things up. And I, I have a small list of mediators who definitely, you know, um, have done that for me in the past. And so I, I'm so appreciative. And now as a mediator myself, I'm always trying to find, you know, what can this case, so I don't lose hope. If a case comes to me and it's really, really tough, you never know. You just have to use as good skills you've learned in training to help the parties come and reach consensus. It's completely possible because trust me, I've seen some mediations that would make your skin crawl, but they worked out. So I want to thank all of you for allowing me to come and share some information. Um, I've been thinking about this for some time, and it's good to have this discussion. Definitely. And yeah. we thank you so much for agreeing to be with us and for empowering us uh, in our um, everyday ways as mediators, but also um, our everyday ways as lawyers or people who see pe other people in conflict. And uh, um, there is a general rule that is always helpful and is being very widely um, quoted here where I live in Poland. This is that being kind always pays off. So uh, it is avoiding this uh, abusive or insulting words like liar is a part of being kind. And uh, whenever we as mediator can encourage people to be kind to each other, that might also become a very good way to bring people closer to the desired agreement. Yes. And uh, Fran, did you have anything else to add before we wrap up? Well, Darcy, just thank you for this excellent presentation today. Once again, you did an outstanding job. Yes, truly appreciate it, Darcy. And again, you can check Darcy out on Twitter at Peace Mediations. And um, for me and Natalia, we're signing off. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us. Until the next video. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.